here, can I borrow a music stand? Can I borrow a music stand? Is that cool? How you guys doing? My name's Howie. You guys good this morning? Good. Um, it's okay to be vocal in here. I know you may not be vocal with a lot of your speakers, but it's okay. You can talk. Oh, I get my own music stand. What's up? Ozark, do it big, baby. All right, all right, all right. So, uh, yeah, this thing is called uh, Messy Grace, and they're like, we know a guy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And it's Latino month, so he looks like a guy. <laughs> like, like uh, I know you're going, it's a Latino month, so they got a Latino to come speak. Wrong! I'm half black and half white, however, I get mistaken for Latino a lot. I don't mind, but I, I kind of have a guilt complex with the whole thing. I go to Honduras and Guatemala uh, from time to time, and when I get there, like, I look just like them. Except, like, I'm, I'm taller. I could be, like, the center on their national Guatemalan team, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and, and I look like them. They think I'm one of them until I start talking. And they're like, ah. Uh. <laughs> you know? And then I don't speak Spanish back, and then I feel guilty all of a sudden. I feel like I'm letting my people down, you know? <laughs> like, what's, what's wrong here? Lord, what's going on, you know? Um, I do pastor a church here in town, I do radio in town, and I'm from Joplin, and uh, my, my mom uh, is white, my dad's black. If I could show you a picture, I want to just kind of tell you a little bit about myself, and kind of a story that I want to talk about today. Is that cool? All right. So, and if time to time I come down there, if there's cameras or something like that, I apologize, but I'm a little out there, okay? Um, I'm not a formally trained speaker, um, but I try to act like one on occasion. So, uh, look at that little guy, isn't he cute? Go, ah. Now, the guy on the shoulders, that would be me, right, right? The brown wonder. <laughs> I'm sitting on my father's shoulders. Isn't that nice? My dad, he's, uh, he was the first African-American Eagle Scout in the state of Missouri. And uh, yeah, my pops, man, my pops, right? And uh, now, this was an important uh, year to me. I, I'm, I'm six years old here. Uh, we lived in Bloomington, Indiana uh, at that time. Indiana, I, you, who's your baby? And uh, my dad taught at Indiana University, and so we were living in Indiana at this time. But this was a pivotal uh, a year for me. Um, I broke my first bone. As you, <laughs> as you can see, I have the cast on. I'm the baby of six, right? And the sister closest to me didn't like me a whole lot because I took their spot. I'm the baby. The closest one older than me is five years older than me, and so, and then I came along, you know what I mean? My, my sister, one of my sister's first words were, take him back. <laughs> <laughs> like, welcome into the world, Howie, you know? So I, they used to, you know, play with me, and they would play kind of rough. It was like, man, it was like a twisted game of Survivor growing up, man. I was always getting voted off the island, you know what I mean? <laughs> it was crazy. And so uh, um, they put me on their feet, and they'd play roller coaster. We didn't have computers and internet, okay? All right, we, we played this and kicked the can. That's about all we had. And so they would put me on their feet and they would boost me up in the air and roller coaster, right? So this summer, they boosted me up in the air and I came down on my arm and broke my arm. Uh, I cried and cried and cried. The only way they'd get me to shut up was stick a Twinkie in my mouth and my mom got home from work. That did the trick. I fell asleep with a Twinkie in my mouth. <laughs> so, that's right. <laughs> Twinkies' lives matter, okay? All right? Everybody's got to have a cause, right? So, so uh, this was an also another pivotal uh, uh, year in my life uh, because I got to meet my step-grandfather. He became my grandfather for the very first time, right? I know you guys think it's weird that, man, he's six years old and he's meeting his grandpa for the first time, you know? And it is kind of strange, you know? We actually showed up on his doorstep and... A little backstory: my dad's black, my mom's white. They were married in L.A. in 1967. It was against the law in the state of Missouri for interracial marriage until 1969. So they got married in a very turbulent time. And my stepfather, my grandmother's new husband, um, was uh, um, a very a big doctor, and he was Caucasian. He was he was uh, white, and um, he was it was very uh, upscale family and. He was a big doctor. He did a lot of research and a lot of groundbreaking research with magnesium. And he was the first doctor on the ground in the Hiroshima, uh, after the bomb in Hiroshima. And um, my grandmother didn't want to tell him that she had black grandchildren. And so we were kept hidden for years, for years and years. 
And my grandpa didn't know until I was six years old. And we showed up on his doorstep. My mom had finally had enough. And we showed up on the doorstep. Drove to El Paso, Texas. And, uh, and we stood there on the doorstep. And it was the moment of truth, right? And the door swings open. And on the trip down, he had gotten the story from Grandma. You know? And he opens the door. And he gets on his knees and he starts crying. And he said, I wish I would have known. He said, I just didn't know. I'm so sorry. I wish I would have known. Now, some of the best news out of that story is I got spoiled for six years I missed. <laughs> right? Right? So I'm like, transform me! You know, you know. <laughs> I tell people that story, and my mom and dad were outcasts. They were my mom's family disowned her, and um, and some of my dad's did um, as well for an interracial marriage in the '60s and '70s. And um, people are always asking me, okay, well, what can we do? You know, I tell I tell them that story, man. They're moved, right? And my first question is, what would your parents say if you brought home somebody of a different race as your boyfriend or girlfriend? Now, don't answer that out loud, but let that sink in, okay? So, a few things uh, from the story. One of the biggest things that it left me kind of thinking, and I wanted to share with you today, was why wait to let time temper your tolerance? He was 80 years old. Why wait? It seems like people wait till the end of their life to all of a sudden become accepting and, and embracing of different cultures and different races. And, and I say, why wait for time to temper your tolerance? We see it. You know, um, uh, uh, George Wallace, the segregationist Alabama governor, he was... Uh, um, a staunch racist early in his life. Toward the end of his life, he became embracing of different cultures and became repentant. We see it all the time. And so with this whole messy grace thing, I want to pull out just a few little principles from this story about us and my grandpa and all the time had passed. And my first point would be, why wait? You have something at your disposal that not many people have, and that is time, the precious commodity of time. And don't wait till it's at its end to become accepting. Go to the next slide here real quick. Peter. Okay, so you know Peter, right? Knucklehead Peter, Popeye. I always call him Popeye. You know, I'm Peter the Sailor Man, you know. A lot of people don't even know who Popeye is, right? I'm, I got to change my culture. My reference is a little bit. It's, so Peter, you guys know the story in Acts chapter 10. Cornelius prays. Peter uh, um, is, is eventually sent to Cornelius. He goes up on the roof. He's praying. Uh, God drops down this sheet and shows him all these kind of animals. And he says, go, Peter, kill, eat. You guys remember that story? All my scriptorians in the house, all right? And he says, go, kill, eat, all right? And Peter was like, no. <laughs> right? I've never eaten anything unclean in my entire life, right? And God's voice spoke and said, don't call something unclean if I've made it clean. Now, what is he saying there? What's really happening? We know this had to do with the law. We know this had to do with Jews and Gentiles. You mentioned it, but, but what does this say? This says, listen, what generations have called, has called unacceptable, I'm now flipping the script and I'm telling you to call it acceptable. My prayer for people in this generation is to have a rooftop moment where by God's sheer spiritual revelation, something takes place in the heart to where it'll have an outward working effect that call, you can accept what God has called unacceptable when it comes to race. That event caused him by direct revelation 
to say it's okay to accept what the generations have not. That is us today in regards to race, and you are the tipping point. Lucky you. (laughs) The last vestige of ignorance is hanging on by a thread. By a thread. I know you watch the news and it looks bad, but whenever it gets really bad, it means it's close to its end. I say don't wait till one day. I always ask this question to myself. What would an 80-year-old you tell a 20-year-old you? We have in our arsenal the ability to pray for rooftop moments for ourselves and other people to get direct revelation and change how generations see race. Don't wait. Messy grace sees people. Uh, could, could you go back one? I believe that's, uh, that's the next one. No, no, no. Did we miss one? No, no, there's another one. <laughs> Is that it? What? <laughs> you sure y'all don't work at Impact Live Church? Oh, come on. <laughs> Travis gets it, and Juliet gets it, right? So this has nothing to do with the message, but uh, Travis introduced me one time, and he said, oh, how he's great. You should hear him speak sometime. He's the only person that it takes 45 minutes to give 15 minutes of information. I'm like... <laughs> okay, I... In a weird way, I was like, thank, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't have this slide, but change by force brings outward compliance. Change by choice births inward transformation. You can't legislate heart change. That's why it takes a spiritual weapon like love, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., That transforms the inside. We have that at our disposal here today. It's why our faith is so crucial. It's a crucial element to racial unity. I can't manufacture unity. If I try to manufacture it, it's 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 a man you factured. Man you factured. And what man puts together usually kind of falls apart. But what God brings together doesn't come apart. You are a part of a people in the wilderness like the Israelites, and the generation prior thinks the promise is too big. They think the giants in the land are too big, and they they may not want to go there. They may not want to go there, and they may tell you you're crazy, but great faith and insanity look an awful lot alike. Yeah? Yeah? You have a choice to say, I won't wait for time to temper my tolerance. I choose today to embrace what others may call unclean. My parents did in 1967 and risked their lives. My mom raped, beat up, carried a 357 Magnum in her purse everywhere she went in L.A. She was dirty mama. (laughs) There's another cultural reference, dirty hair. I got to get some new ones here. They risked it all. Go to the finished product slide. Messy grace sees people as a finished product of the king, not a stereotype product of the culture. Let's take that in for a minute. Take that in. Messy grace sees people as a finished product of the king. When I was coming back to Christianity, actually before I was coming back to Christianity, I was angry. I, you know, both my ears pierced, my nose pierced, wild hair. I was a crazy DJ. I was certifiably crazy. I was on alcohol, addicted to cocaine, um, addicted to just about everything you could be addicted to. And I was insane. The psychiatrist used to fire me. (laughs) They, They used to say, 
Mr. Nunley, don't come back. We can't help you. I'm like, what are you? You're supposed to help me. You're a psychiatrist, man. Isn't that what you studied for? They used to tell me, don't come back. And after suicide attempt and suicide attempt, completed suicide, I was successful two times. The Lord saw fit other things, right? And so I end up in a padded room. I end up in a psych ward. And there's one guy that will come see me. Like, I burned every single bridge, right? Every bridge. There was one guy that came and see me, and he was a pastor. And he was like the 74-year-old, gray-haired, Caucasian pastor. And he's coming to see me. <laughs> right? But you know what he did? He saw me as a finished product of the king. <laughs> and he loved me past my dysfunction. He didn't see me as this wide eyed, insane African American that's angry. I was mad. I was mad at everyone. I was mad at everyone. Because I felt I had been mistreated for one reason or another, and it was everybody else's fault. He loved me past my sin. And because of it, I was transformed. His faith became dangerous when it challenged the stereotype. Okay, can you hear the disciples now? Right? I mean, if you ever, like, got around the campfire with the disciples, I can imagine it was a pretty interesting conversation. Right? I mean... Ladies, they're gross guys, okay? Walk into a locker room, I'm sure it was that on steroids, okay? Can you imagine what they were saying as they walk up and they see Jesus by himself and he's sitting by a well and he's rapping with this lady? Not just any lady. I mean, what, imagine what was going through their head. What is wrong with this man? I mean, they'd seen him do some pretty unorthodox stuff, but this was above the pale. He was talking to a woman who'd been married multiple times, living with a dude that was not her husband. She was an outcast. She went to the well by herself, which was not something that she did, but she did because she was seen as an outcast. And Jesus is offering her life? What does he think he's doing? I can tell you exactly what he was doing. He saw past her marriages. He saw past that she was a Samaritan. He saw past her adultery. He saw past everything else. He saw past her ethnicity and said, there's a daughter of the king. Yeah. And he proved it. Jesus saw who she was in the father's eyes and it allowed him to see past what she was labeled in the culture's eyes. At some point, we must place a demand on the spirit within us to see past the earthly realm. Are you saying, Howie, you tell me not to see color? No, you see my color, okay? I'm a golden buttery brown. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, you know, <laughs> I'm saying, people spend a lot of money to look like this, man. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> so you can see it and compliment it <laughs> but I know the spirit me I know the spirit me is what God sees and it's all different colors wrapped up into one yeah you have that ability you have that ability to see past the outside things and to see to the inward. It's those faith eyes that have to come alive. And if you don't have those, spend every night praying for those because your ministry will grow. Your ministry will flourish because you won't be relegated to one segment of the population. You can truly go to all of the nations. You can hug the dirty people. You can hug the brown people. You can love on the pimps and the prostitutes. You can love the millionaire. You see what I'm saying? You have faith eyes that see finished products. If you'll let it happen, the choice is yours. That's what my grandpa saw. He saw in me what I could be. And not just this.
messy grace says my reputation must be of no regard. That's hard to hear, isn't it? I mean, we spend a lot of time and effort protecting my reputation. Do you know who I am? Do you know my pedigree? Do you know how much time has been invested? I must protect my reputation. And I get it. You don't want to hang out with the ants and say I'm a saint. You know, I get it. My grandpa risked it. And you know... He doted on us. Like he displayed us as these treasures, right? I mean, it was like we were the prodigal sons and he slips a ring on our finger and a robe around us and parades us around town and says, these are my grandkids. Give them candy. (laughs) Right? (laughs) I mean, we talk a lot about the prodigal son, you know, and his issues. We talk about the prodigal, uh, you know, the the brother who has his issues. But not many people think about the father's reputation, which was probably on the line too. An upstanding man in the community. He'd been swindled by his own son, basically, and made to look like a fool. But he looked over the hill every day. And then when the son came home, Papa took him and showed him off. Not for the sake of showing him off and look what I've got, but showing him off saying, look what God did. Amen. (laughs) My grandpa's reputation was no longer of any regard. He didn't care what people said. He didn't care what people thought. My charge to you today, if you will, is don't wait. Don't wait. Don't wait for time to temper your tolerance. Don't wait to see people as finished product till they got it all together. Guess what? You don't have it together. And if you ever do properly all the way get it together, don't talk to me. (laughs) And don't friend me on Facebook. I don't want to see pictures of your togetherness. (laughs) I'll post passive aggressive insults. (laughs) Anybody see those, man? Don't wait. You have something that people have died for. You have something that my parents sacrificed for. You have something these people here are sacrificing for. And you have something that our king was nailed to a cross for. Not just so we can be reconciled to the Father, but so we can be ministers of reconciliation in everything we do. It's something supernatural. It's not in my human ability to to bring people together to cause a work of unity, but I guarantee you that once you set your mind to it, once you set your hand to it, and once you've readied your heart, every ounce of power and ability and provision from heaven is waiting on you. And you have a cloud of witnesses of all races. 
every tongue, <laughs> every tribe. Go and go. Bring them together. Reconcile them to the Father and reconcile them to one another. Go. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't wait. You got it. Go, 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 go. Let me pray for you. Is that cool? Amen. That this sinks down deep into your spiritual bones and the marrow underneath, yeah? And that it has an outward effect from an inward change because today I believe you made the choice to not let time temper your tolerance and to accept what generations before you have said, no, 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 that's not for us. Papa, in Jesus' name, you are good. You prove you're good, and you don't have to prove anything to me. But you prove it. I don't know how everything works. I don't know how everything's put together. I see in part, I prophesy in part. But, Papa, I know that you've got a plan, and that each person in this room can be a part of that plan to see what you see to hear what you hear and to have their heart beat in the same rhythm as yours. For that is the rhythm of heaven. It's the beat of your heart. And today, we give ourselves to that. We make a choice to lend ourselves to that. If that means we go through a process where we must be blinded and then scales fall off, Papa, I ask for your Holy Spirit to bring divine revelation in areas that they've never seen before. Open their eyes up to things, they've, and ideas they've never known before. Open up dialogue in their families that maybe for family lines have not been accepting of what you are bringing into this generation. But Lord, they're gonna stand up and they're going to say, today it ends and we repent over years and years of maybe stuff that we've done or maybe my family has been a part of. But today, I choose to embrace what generations have said no to. Just like you embrace us. Past our dysfunction. While we were yet sinners, Christ, you died for us. Thank you for this moment in the present, in this time. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you.